What happens when law, business, and life collide? Each week on Lead Council, your host Tom Tona will take a deep dive into topics related to the law, the business of law, and life. There will be insightful discussions with industry insiders, experts, and thought leaders making significant contributions and meaningful differences in their fields of expertise. Tom is the founder and managing attorney at Tona Law. He has been a practicing attorney since 1994 and the leader of Tona Law since it opened in 2001. The goal of this podcast is to provide you with free information on law and the business of law and to give you actionable tools related to each of these areas. Now, here's Tom. All right. So today's guest is Glenn Gutek. Glenn is out of Orlando, right, Glenn? Yeah, I'm, in, I'm currently okay. in Orlando. Okay. Glenn is with Atticus. I think the name is full name is Atticus Advantage, but I always, everybody calls it Atticus. One of the original coaching entities in the space, there's like a bajillion of them now, but Glenn was a personal group facilitator for me for, God, it's probably about seven or eight years, right, Glenn? Yeah. Cause I think you even go back as far back as my first PGP group. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So it's been close to a decade that we know each other. And, uh, Glenn is one of the OGs in the space in terms of law firm executive coaches. So I'm excited to have him on today. Welcome to the podcast, Glenn. Well, thank you for the invitation. It's good to be here. So you've been with Atticus since 2000, right? 2000. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, at that point in time, Atticus was very connected to the Florida market of real estate attorneys. Mark Powers had been very instrumental in helping Florida real estate attorneys adjust to some changes that were happening in that marketplace. And the title company, Attorney's Title Insurance, had made an investment in Atticus for coaching and uh, they needed to grow and expand. And that's when I joined. And for a period of time, it was Mark, Patrick, Wilson, and myself. Yeah, I was going to say, so you guys are like the originators, man. And Patrick, who's my personal one-on-one coach, what I learned from you in the beginning, right? Through the group facilitations that you did. And then the stuff that I've been doing with the one-on-one with Patrick, there's no way I would have gotten to the place that I am right now without that foundational coaching background from you guys and Atticus in general. Like it was just instrumental, right? So uh, I know it seems like it's very in vogue now coaching, right? And there's more coaches than there are students. Sometimes it feels even though there's 450,000 attorneys in the US, but there is not one person who ever contacts me about coaching that I don't say, look, you got to talk to Atticus, right? Like you need the foundation to be built before you can talk about all the other stuff. So the fact that you and Patrick have been doing it for 23 plus years really does put you in rarefied air. Like when you guys were doing it, was there any such thing as a law firm executive coach? (laughs) What's kind of interesting is there was some research done as to what to call us, because at that period of time, at least within the legal services and law firms, the phrase or term of coach was seen as a pejorative term. Nobody really wanted to work as a coach. It was heavily linked at that period of time. The only kind of coaches seemed to be, quote unquote, life coaches. And so there was some terminology debated as to whether we were consultants, coaches, and we actually landed on the phrase practice advisors, which was a term that we used early on and and, and sort of defined us. So much of the concept of coaching was heavily linked to a migration that was happening in therapeutic models and not necessarily in the consultative world related to business development and leadership development. Yeah. And what I find interesting, so you use a lot of the terminology I've heard with Patrick, where there's a difference between a coach and a consultant. And I always refer to Patrick when I refer people to him as a coach consultant, right? Like Mm -hmm. sometimes I just want the answer. And I'm like, hey, man, skip all the mumbo jumbo and I'll do the self-discovery. Give me the answer. That's more of the consulting side, right? They come in, you diagnose and you treat. And then there is the coaching side. You do both, right? Like you're pretty much in the same type of role. Yeah, I think that Atticus as an organization has embraced a sort of hybrid model. Because we enter into such long-term relationships with our clients, there is an opportunity for self-discovery, right? You know, classic the answer lies within you. Right. But in, in any given business climate, time is of the essence. And so if there are opportunities for us to say, hey, try this, we know it works, and then we can accelerate the process by bringing best practices to bear to your practice, and it makes sense, and then you can execute it, I think we try to do that. We have some 
ready-made processes, ready-made solutions that we can turn around and implement. In fact, you know, when you first came to the practice builder and, you know, the practice builder, it was a two-day intensive workshop that walked people through what we called then the seven steps of re-engineering your law firm. And then you rolled into the practice growth program. And what we were trying to attempt in the practice growth program, which was a group training, group consulting, group coaching, all lumped together was plug and play solutions to get your practice from one level to the another. And then we also offer a program and you were a part of that and worked in the group that we did in Dallas, which was a dominate your market. And one of the, one of the questions I sometimes get, I don't know if other members of our team use this distinction, but I always tell people what the difference is between the practice growth program and the dominate your market program is this. In the practice growth program, we're trying to give you tools and techniques and processes to help you gain control of your practice. And in Dominate Your Market, we're trying to shift the way you think about your practice so that you can lose control of it. Right, 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 right. right. And so if you think about, you know, when you're a technician who's working in the practice and not working on the practice, the number one thing you got to do is how do I harness this thing? How do I get control of it? How do I manage this in a way that I eventually get, get to a place where I'm the leader and a lot of the growth happens in ways that it not beyond my vision, but probably beyond my control? Yeah, 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 yeah. And I remember you talking about that, you know, very early on, that that was the mission at DYM was to, okay, now you've gotten control. Now we got to get you to give up control. Right. Which again, you know, it's different entrepreneurial models. They just call it different things. Like EOS calls it letting go of the vine, right? Mm -hmm. Same exact thing. So 23 years ago, what drew you to law firm coaching? I have to know (laughs) because like Patrick was a lawyer, different story. Like how did you get into the space? Well, I heard Patrick Wilson was a coach and I said, I want to be like Patrick Wilson. How do I get to be like him? (laughs) That's funny. Patrick and I were once the solo and founding members of the Mutual Admiration Society. (laughs) (laughs) We're the same age, except I got married and had children a little earlier. So I was actually a little ahead of him on that scale. And so we just really connected and bonded over that. But my professional background is kind of interesting because initially I was in academia. I, I taught in college at a fairly young age, studied philosophy and psychology. And uh, in my academic preparation, I was going to eventually, I took the LSATs and was going to go to law school and was going to be a lawyer. But my primary interest in going to law school was I thought about going into politics and Ah, um, uh, something happened on the way to the presidency. And that is, as I uh, met a girl and fell in love and she had zero interest in being related to, enamored with, involved with, and certainly married to a politician. Zero interest. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and uh, and to this day, I am grateful that she rescued me from that life of humiliation. We, You mm-hmm. know, we talk about it all the time. It's these little pivot points in life that as you look back, like I think we're all around the same age. I'm 55. I might be older than you. I don't know. But yeah, you're a little um, younger than me. Oh, OK. Well, isn't it funny? Like you look back at that pivotal decision and you realize just how impactful it was in terms of the trajectory of your life, how it could have been totally different by chance. Yeah. Yeah. It's just crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. And Tammy, my wife, um, her brother was a practicing attorney in Charlotte, North Carolina. And uh, I remember meeting him and getting to know him. And he discouraged me from going to law school. He discouraged me from considering being a politician. He discouraged me from being a lawyer. And um, I'm going to mention another name that you know that you may not be aware of, but my best friend from high school, he was graduating from college, same time I was graduating from college, and he was going off to seminary and took me on his seminary visit. And I visited it, and I was a little bit of a quandary then. Do I go to law school? Do I go to seminary? And I decided to go okay. to seminary. So, oh, wow. Who yeah. was that? Who was that? Who was that? Uh, Glenn Finch. Oh, okay. Awesome. And you guys all ended up in Atticus together. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. So years later, when he was thinking about doing something different, You know, when you graduate there, you know, I was in the ministry for 10 years. I was in Florida and I was in California. And um, I was talking to Steve Riley about this. And there's this element where sometimes when you're invested in doing the work of God, it destroys the work of God in you. Okay. And that was sort of happening to me. It was certainly happening in a lot of my relationships at that period of time. And it didn't feel great for me. And so I started exploring. I'd done at that point in time, I'd had opportunities to do a lot of motivational speaking. And even that didn't appeal to me, you know, going and doing a one hit wonder presentation that got a lot of oohs and ahs and then you left. And so I knew I didn't want to do motivational speaking. In fact, to this day, you know, I, I do a fair amount of speaking 
And uh, people who don't fully understand what I do say, oh, are you a motivational speaker? And I, I want to cringe at that. I just want to. Uh. So when I heard about coaching as an emerging vocation, it seemed like a great fit for me because it was an opportunity for me to do speaking, but then also for me to stick around and be instrumental in the transformation process. And I was always fascinated with leadership and how leaders impact organizations and had had some successes as a leader in my life at that point in time and had some failures as a leader at that point in time in my life. I was about 32, 33 years old. And so that for me, actually uh, started doing a coaching practice, uh, was forming that. And then I was um, introduced to Atticus and introduced to Mark Powers. And at that moment in time, it really was an interesting convergence of having an interest in the law without having gone to law school and not having to be a lawyer. It's like the best of both worlds. I, I, I got to be honest with you. It was the best of both worlds. It really, I love lawyers. I love the way lawyers think. And I like the way lawyers think about solving problems. And um, I was telling my kids this. So when I was a pastor in Marathon, Florida, which is an island in the middle of the Florida Keys, and they had a hospital. And because of my background, they asked me to be on the hospital's ethics committee. And so I was 26 at the time, 27, somewhere in that age range. And I was sitting on an ethics committee of a hospital. And I was horrified by the lack of commitment of doctors to the ethical positions of their profession. <laughs> and I was horrified by it. Right? The way they stretched the concept of do no harm was horrifying to me. <laughs> And so I will say this, in any given profession, there's bad actors. But as a group, I know a lot of lawyers. And I will tell you that the overwhelming majority of them have probably one of the highest commitment to the ethical standards of their profession. They take it seriously. They're constrained by it. They try to figure out how to navigate within those constraints without ever violating those constraints more than any other profession that I know of. And so I love lawyers, but I don't have to be one. Which, you know, just to compile on it as I'm listening to you at the 10,000 foot level, one... I know a little bit about your background. You're a sports fanatic, specifically baseball, right? You have a background in theology and philosophy and your love of the law without having to be in it. It all kind of makes sense, right? Because at certain points, if you're coaching somebody on a one-on-one -on -one, or even in a group setting, they're going to pull you aside. They're going to be basically your, you're their pastor confessor. Sometimes you're going to be their coach. So it makes sense. You took a background on the first link, like the running joke with philosophy majors is great. Now, what are you going to do to pay the bills? Right. But you took this fantastic amalgam of all the things that you loved and you're using it every day. So yeah. think about like you probably have a very high satisfaction score in terms of the career you chose for yourself. Yeah. The last 24 years and, you know, the high satisfaction score is rooted in three things, four things. It's a good fit for who I am. It's been financially rewarding. You know, I love my clients. I really value and treasure them and I have a high degree of regard and respect for them. And number four, I'm not a lone practitioner. And right. my relationship to Atticus has sustained my need and desire to improve. I'm not so sure I would love it nearly as much if I were a lone practitioner. I don't get together often enough with Mark or with Steve or Regina or Nora or Patrick or even Glenn Finch, which is tragic. But when we are working together, collaborating together, thinking together, I walk out of that room humbled and inspired at the same time because. You know, those are some of the most dedicated and sharp people that I've ever been able to hang out yeah, with. Yeah, yeah. I mean, talk about a brilliant group of thinkers. I've never seen such a collaborative group of really deep thinkers so that anytime I've ever been in a room with any of you, I walk out just a better version with different ideas and thinking about how I'm thinking. And, you know, I know I think Steve Riley. I'm pretty sure it's a real term, but maybe Riley coined it, which was that metacognition, understanding and thinking about how you understand and think, right? Um, maybe he didn't coin it. I think that's actually a scientific term and I made that <laughs> up. But, but one of the things that I love, and you know, I talk about it a lot on LinkedIn and I talk about it with anybody that calls me up because I'm such a huge proponent of coaching. And I started writing a book recently and I'm going into the history of how I built my business and the impact of law firm coaching. I probably have spent about seven figures in coaching over the years, and I'm probably up to roughly $100,000 a year now between all of the different fractional coaches I have and all of the different programs I'm in and then the masterminds. It's never even been a thought that I wouldn't make that investment in myself. And I don't understand how people are running a law practice, even if it's a sole practitioner. 
how they do that without an understanding of the business basics, you know? So, and then, but you hear statistics and, you know, a general statistic as a guesstimate, somebody once said to me, the average profit margin that a sole practitioner is working off probably roughly 3%. I was like, 3%. Good Lord. Like, so you basically, you built a nice job. You're that technician that Gerber talks about in the e-myth. But I think what you guys are doing is pretty special, right? Oh, and for, to be thank doing it, you know, at 23 years in and still have that passion for it. You're still doing one-on-one -on -one coaching? Yeah, I, I do uh, a fair amount of one-on-one -on -one coaching. I don't work in the practice growth program as much anymore, which I kind of miss. Okay. But, you know, I work with the Dominate Your Market group. And then I do a lot of firm retreats, which is the combination of all those things are really, if I only did one of those things, I think I'd get a little bored. It's the diversity of all those things that makes things pretty interesting. Yes. But I also think that the fact that you're still fascinated by the impact of that leaders can have on their organization and specifically in the uh, law firm space, I think that that's what kind of keeps you, you know, I hate to use the word motivated because motivation could be fleeting, but I mean, I know that the schedule you were on at one time doing the group facilitations, the one-on-ones, like you're a pretty busy guy, you know, you and yeah. Patrick is like all over the country, frequent flyer miles everywhere. <laughs> so do me a favor, share a story with a lot of lawyers listening to this. Share a story where leadership profoundly influenced one of your clients, both positive, where you were like, yeah, this person really grew into their own. And then one where you were like, uh, you could see why the law firm hit a ceiling of sorts, if you can share that. Yeah. So I'll be a little bit cryptic to protect the innocent. Of course, um, of course. If I, if I can. When you dissect bad decision making almost in any organization, at the heart of what you will find is a lot of insular thought without any external feedback or perspective to penetrate the bubble to challenge the false assumptions that often lead to bad decision making, right? I think we are now starting to unpack what I think was a horrific decision making frame in what was going on in our COVID response. And at the core of it was just the absolute insular fear of external input to broaden the parameters for decision making. I know not everybody will agree with me. I think in time, the evidence will really start to point in that direction. But with that being said, one of the great stories, I got to work with a practice group within a fairly decent sized firm. That was really fun. It was a practice group that had begun to hit sort of a plateau year in, year out. And they were bringing in two younger partners and the two younger partners were thoroughly dissatisfied with the income return on investment of what it meant to be a partner, both in the practice group and in the firm as a whole. One of the wonderful things children give you is the need to make more money, especially if you have daughters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can attest to that for sure. <laughs> oh, my gosh. You know, last year was probably my most financially rewarding year. It also coincided in a year where I had to, two daughters get married. I had two weddings. I wonder if there's any relationship between those. Things. That will motivate <laughs> you every single time. <laughs> it was very motivational. So that dynamic caused them to bring in outside perspective because there had been so much insular thinking about the law practice and repetition of what has been done in the past. And, you know, can we keep the course kind of thinking? And so the infusion of new blood. Well, one of those new partners, I think, is one of the more naturally gifted communicators, visionaries. And uh, not only asserts a degree of leadership, owns a degree of responsibility, and then is committed to uh, growing in that regard and really was a spearhead for the practice group's continuous growth and expansion. Give you an example, just rough numbers. Within six years, they had doubled their revenue at least twice as a, as a oh, practice wow. group. Nice. Wow. Nice. And they had reached a point, quite honestly, where it was becoming difficult to, from an economic perspective to see if it made sense for them to stay as a part of the larger firm. And, you know, these guys, we would meet in retreat setting twice a year. I would meet with them in a retreat setting and then we'd also coach with them. Uh, we would really spend a lot of time looking at vision and strategy. And they came to the conclusion that it was silly for them to walk away from the firm. A better move would be to exercise a greater degree of leadership, not control, but leadership in the larger firm through its governance model. And eventually this individual who was a leader within the practice group became a managing partner of the firm. And the very same oh, dynamics wow. that were applied at the practice group level now were being employed in multiple practice groups and transformed the landscape 
landscape of the firm as a whole and lifted the needle on on what they would financially would see growth. And uh, more importantly, in an organization like that, in terms of thinking of succession models so that there is a, a development of future leadership happening throughout the organization. So if you don't think about that. So that's that's one story. And it's a young leader moving into a practice group, exercising leadership within the context of that practice group that gave them credibility to exercise leadership within the larger firm. And then the, you know, the distribution of some principles that have helped the entire firm grow. And, you know, I will tell you that that is not a stress-free process. And, you know, the one thing about leadership requires courage, primarily because anybody who decides to lead has to recognize that they're putting a target on their back and there are going to be plenty of people who will enjoy shooting at that target. Right. You know. Other than courage, what would you say are like the main key components that would make up a leader in the legal field or any any field in your opinion? I actually believe that sort of courage in some ways precedes vision mm-hmm. because if you ask what components are critical, at some level you have to see a preferred or better future. Because if you don't see a better future, I'm not sure what actions you will take to galvanize a group of people to move in a consistent direction. Mm -hmm. Now, there are some who are really great at communicating that vision, and there are others that are eh, at it. But regardless, I think there has to be this ability to see there's a better way. And I think we all benefit if we all go there. Mm -hmm. I I think that's a, a really key component of that. Well, and the courage component also. Sorry, Jules, go ahead. No, it's okay. I was just saying that's honestly very accurate, especially because I think Tom has noticed since he's solidified his vision and communicated that really well, has seen the firm really start to head in that direction because people can actually see where they're headed now. Yeah. It's very accurate. And you know what's funny, Glenn, as you're talking about all of this stuff, I remember the early days of DYM with you. And I remember you guys talking about succession planning. Now I'm going back. God, I had to be 45. So I'm like, ah, succession planning. Like, yeah, that's something old guys do. And now I'm into four months of like real succession planning. You mentioned it earlier and that's what kind of triggered it for me because it's been an obsession of mine right now because (laughs) at 55, my runway is shorter and I am also looking at a level of talent that really requires that opportunity, right? And so as a law firm, we've reached a maturation stage where the people we want to retain and attract and all of those things are also people that want to see future growth opportunities, right? Mm -hmm. But I remember you talking about these fundamental concepts going back at the first year of DYM. And I guess it's weird the way the process works, right? Because as somebody who's been an advocate of Atticus forever, of yours forever, of Patrick's forever, and the whole group in general, the fundamentals don't change. They just take on different significance as you grow Mm -hmm. in your skills and experience as a leader, right? Tying it back to what you were talking about. Yeah. I'm at a stage in life where I'm mildly entertained and chuckled at the things that I thought were stupid I now understand why they matter. (laughs) Right, right. (laughs) Listen, you guys had us doing core values exercises at one year in DYM. And I was like, I get it. I could do core values. And you look them up, you do your research. I have just got to the point by January of last year where I actually figured out one, not only who am I at 54, but what does my law firm stand for? What is our culture? What are, and the importance of core values at the foundation of literally everything, everything. But yeah, it's stuff you were preaching all along. Like you said, it takes on different significance once you have those aha moments. Yeah. You know, and that to me is why you alluded to it earlier. People who both achieve results, and I also would pair with that experience enjoyment or satisfaction in the achievement of results. Cause I, I've seen the tragic reality that there are some really high achievers who live in a land of misery. Yes. Mm. There's something elusive to me about that. Why bother? Right. Right. We ought to not only pursue growth, but enjoy the process. Right. The reason coaching is so significant or relevant or important to that is a coach provides an agitation that causes you to grow And as you're growing, you actually begin to understand at significantly deeper levels information that you had learned earlier or understood earlier. 
right? Yes. And so the risk of not having some coaches in your life is there's this wealth of information that you've learned, but you never get to the point where you really understand why it mattered, right? That is gold. Mm -hmm. That is gold, yeah. man. <laughs> and coaches are like essential for that accountability to keep changing and to keep growing because I mean, by yourself, you can obviously get very comfortable in your own but stick ways. With that, stick with that concept of agitation for a second. Cause yeah, a hundred percent, right? Jules, the, yeah. the accountability structure, especially for law firm owners mm -hmm. is really important for anybody that's listening to this. You know, you have your little fiefdom and you might be a sole practitioner or be like two to 10 employees, but there's no accountability structure without somebody like a Glenn or Patrick or the Atticus PGP group or DYM group to just call you out. And quite make you question assumptions, but that concept you just brought up of agitation, I want to stick with for a second because I've been going through it again as we were experiencing these growth spurts over the last, since January, 2023, we started doing EOS. I was getting more and more agitated and it was like stressing me out, man. Like I would, everybody would go around the table. How's everybody feel at the end of a quarterly meeting? Everybody'd be like, great. And I would be like, I feel like I want to jump out of my skin. Right. And he said, well, agitation is good, right? Because like you're saying that external influence, right? Like you don't have an agenda other than to bring out the best and the people you're coaching, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what's so special about like you. I still, I call Patrick the wizard because he'll get me to do something without me realizing he's getting me to do it because he <laughs> knows my personality too because I'm the first guy to be like, I'm not doing that just because you <laughs> said it. So at one point I turned to him and I said, dude, you planned that whole thing. You planned the whole outcome of what was going to happen without telling me what to do. You led me to it as an excellent coach would. He's kind of like my Yoda, right? Yeah. Like I consider you guys like the Yoda of the law practice. So that agitation thing is very beneficial, but man, like I'm getting that feeling right now as I'm talking about it. I want to jump out of my skin because you don't necessarily know why you're agitated. Can you do me a favor? You said it's a coach's role to agitate you. Dig yeah. down a little bit for that. D dig down because you got my skin crawling right now. It's making me <laughs> uncomfortable. So I want to understand it more. Why am I so uncomfortable? Yeah. You know, by the way, those who have their PhDs in philosophy are going to hate me for this, but I can't remember whether it was Plato or Socrates that called themselves a gadfly. Okay. And they saw the role of the philosopher, you know, back in ancient Greece and you know, is to be a gadfly, to fly around in the face, to make people swat at it, to sort of be agitated. You know, a okay. gadfly agitates you. You know, they don't have these things anymore, but the centerpiece of a washing machine was called a agitator. Agitator. And yep. what its job was is in the mix of the soap and the water was to suck and pull the clothes down on one end and then to shoot it back up. So that every part of the clothing was affected by that solution to clean it. And then another, this is another interesting, I just heard this recently, John Orberg gave this to me and it's a leader's job is to disappoint people at a rate that they can stand. <laughs> right? All right. And that's what that agitation is. It is constantly kind of poking and prodding and pulling so that a bigger picture and a bigger understanding of what dynamics are at play and that are happening here and now that you have a fuller understanding in that. And what distinguishes it from most people in the marketplace is most people are reacting to everything. And if you don't have a coach, whether it's a professional coach or a mentor or somebody who's sort of outside of your environment giving you feedback, you will get insular in your thinking and you will become almost exclusively reactionary in your problem solving, right? You know, Juliet, you asked a question earlier mm -hmm. and, you know, what attributes or characteristics are critical for leaders? Courage is one, vision is another. I also think that you move through life in a way that re you reflect on things, right? So experiences mm -hmm. and opportunities in life, you sort of look back at them and go, what did I learn from that? Or what the hell was that? <laughs> right? Right. Yeah. Right. And you ponder those kind of questions and reflect on them so that next time you don't just merely react to circumstances and stimulus and, and situations and opportunities. You start to respond to them. And more often than not, if you're a reflective leader with a clear vision governed by a set of core values, your responses will be more effective, will be more fruitful, 
whether they are, you know, taking advantage of business opportunities or developing talent. But coming back to this thing of agitation, you know, a good coach agitates the leader or the boots on the ground in such a way that they have sort of a fuller understanding of the circumstances that are at play here, that are at work, that they become a little less reactionary, a little bit more reflective, and then are able to respond more consistently. Talk about agitation. One of my favorite definitions of leadership is leaders take people from here to there. But it's interesting. I was talking to my son about this last night. Generally, as a rule of thumb, we will never go there unless here is totally unlivable. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. And so a good coach that is agitating you is making being here. So you think about your EOS and you sit through that meeting. What's happening to you is, is staying static is no longer attractive to you. Right. Right. right? Yeah. And it feels like an uneasiness. Right. Yeah. And that, and that was the same thing we would get. I mean, when I refer to the Dallas group that I was in when you were the facilitated with Steve Riley, that group was always agitating you forward because you, you couldn't help it being surrounded by the powerhouse people in that group. It was just, you had to get agitated. Mm-hmm. You had to be looking around going, there's got to be more yeah. and different. There had to be a different way to do it. I think that statement, there's got to be more, is definitely one that like repeats a lot, especially like with certain agitations and like professional growth and like business growth. Yeah. And, by, and just so I can qualify, I don't mean more as in more money. Mm-hmm. I mean more as in a different way of doing things other than the status quo, right? Like mm-hmm. Glenn and in that group when he was facilitating was they were huge on client-centered practices without it needing to be you at the center of that all of the time. Mm -hmm. And it was really revolutionary at the time that you guys were teaching this stuff. It still is, though it's more commonplace because there's a lot of uh, copycats, I guess, uh, you know, uh, what do they say? Uh, Copying is not copying. What does this say? Flattery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is the highest form of flattery Mm -hmm. is uh, somebody who's copying you. So again, you guys are the originals in this group. Like I know that before Atticus, I had never heard of the concept. So what you do and what you guys bring to the table is really pretty special and pretty unique. I still think in the marketplace, I mean, I've had my exposure to a wide swath of people, some of whom I employ, some of whom I would never recommend or employ if they were the last executive coaches on earth. So uh, (laughs) you guys are literally the first words out of my mouth anytime. Like I've had people approach me and say, hey, would you coach me? I'm like, no, right now you got to get the foundation fundamentals. And the one thing that was never explained to me when I was in Atticus was join the group program for the conceptual foundational elements that apply to every law firm. And if you're struggling where you want one-on-one tailored advice, well, then you got to implement the one-on-one coaching, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're not going to get that from the group setting. But, and I always tell people, that's just the distinction. If you want the core fundamental concepts, you join the very beginning of the group. And listen, Glenn, you know me, there wasn't one thing that I learned from Atticus or you or anybody that I didn't implement and try. If it failed or it didn't work, I would either discard it or adjust it. But honestly, it worked. Everything, everything that you guys put out as content worked. It works. Mm -hmm. So shift a little bit because I know that a hot topic today is technology, right? It's significantly impacting the world. Law practices are moving at lightning speed. It's been a huge blessing to us because we're early adopters of technology. Can you give me some examples? Because you work with a bunch of law firms across the country of the technological changes that you are currently witnessing and what you think the best practices are for technological adoption at this point. Yeah, well, I'm happy to say that some of my clients are getting rid of their IBM Selectric tr- 2 <laughs> and they're putting uh, PCs uh, on their on their desk and they, they see a bright future in the personal computer. <laughs> You're hilarious. <laughs> I will tell you the the two things that have probably shifted the most in the years that I've been working with law firms. Number one, the number of female shareholder attorneys, women in the law firm. That is a huge shift. I I remember 24 years ago, you know, we would do a workshop and let's say there were a hundred people out there in that workshop, four or five of them would be women. If there's a hundred people in a workshop, if it's not 50%, it's getting awfully close to 50%. So I, I think I think that is impacted at the marketplace in a lot of different positive ways. And it's fun to see that really come full circle. 
the other factor is technology. And part of the reason I joke is I actually do remember having a conversation with a client who was trying to debate whether to spend $250 for a new fax machine. <laughs> Aren't fax machines even $250 anymore? I don't even know if they're still around anymore. We don't even use one. We use an e-fax. If you have one, you might have to pay somebody $250 to take it off your hands. I am not a tech wizard by any stretch of the imagination. So I tend to come at it and I'm going... When you have major technological shifts, the way that we have to think about those things change. And I'm not sure lawyers yet are getting the distinction between what artificial intelligence is versus what a search engine is. Right, right, right. They're not the same. It's not one on stereos. I, I use the analogy that my dad was in the military back in the 19, late 1940s, early 1950s, and he was a topographer, photographer, he did topography, maps, and photography work. And then after coming out of the military, he was a photographer. And then he realized he had to feed his family and became an accountant. But <laughs> photography was always a hobby of his. And when back in the 1980s, all us kids put money together so that my dad could get one of those big luggable video cameras. But right. what I noticed is, is that my dad never adjusted and he used a video camera much in the same way that he would use a still photography camera, 35 millimeter. You guys okay. go over and stand in front of that building and I'm going to I'm going to videotape you. And he didn't realize the power of voice recording and motion and movement and all of that. And so he was using a video camera, much like people who are using artificial intelligence today are using it very much like it's a Google and it's not. Um, there was a little bit of a humor related to the bad launch of uh, Google's Gemini artificial intelligence. Yep. And when you really examine what went wrong with that, you see an example of the distinction because what went wrong with that is people were asking Gemini to give me images or pictures of historical figures in the past. And it was basically saying, based on our view of the future, here's what those figures would have looked like in the past. Right. And it okay. came out all wrong. Right. A black woman pope does not compute. Right. Artificial intelligence is really learning how to prompt it with the merging of information sources from a variety of perspectives to create new intelligence. It is not really ideal for giving you good insight on what has existed. Right. 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 And, and so lawyers are a little bit hesitant and a little bit reluctant to experiment with it and implement it because I still think that they're using it much in the way in which they would have used an associate to go on to Google or, or LexisNexis and do historic legal research. And yeah. I don't think that that's the best paradigm for how you think about it. And I don't think we quite fully understand how to take advantage of it. I think we're secretly hoping that it'll replace people and it'll drive down costs. And I think it will at some point in time. But I don't know if anybody knows exactly how yet. But the key, I think, is, is law firms have got to experiment with artificial intelligence in creating new work product new insight, new marketing, more new messaging, new imagery, new metaphors for what the lawyer will be doing in the future. I know yeah. that that's not a highly practical answer, but I think if we're going to capitalize on the practical solutions, we have to first get the conceptual shift. Yeah. And, and basically though, it's interesting the way you said it, because one of the things that I'm always doing is I study a lot of the AI stuff in terms of what I don't know. Right. And I can fill volumes on that, but when you realize like, oh, it's about how you prompt it. I know that the Atticus motto is great practice, great life. Then I heard Mark Power say the other day, it's not a motto, it's a promise. <laughs> so do me a favor because I know you're a huge proponent of soul, right? Maintaining one's soul and self in the pursuit of a professional and personal vision, give me some, like for people that are 10 to 20 years behind the learning curve that I currently have, you know, I'm doing this 30 years. I've been with Atticus, God, like almost 15 years now, I think. What are you telling somebody who's just thinking about going to Atticus who doesn't really know what it's about or calling you say, Glenn, I want you to coach me in the context of not selling one's soul in pursuit of professional and personal vision. 
You know, one of the reasons I love doing podcasts is there's a sort of unpredictable nature to the questions that you're going to be asked. And I don't think I've ever been asked that question. So I'm going to be entertained <laughs> in, 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 in thinking about it on the spot. Right. But what a fascinating and provocative and agitating question to ask. <laughs> um, Good. I hope to agitate you. <laughs> you know, I make a promise to my clients, you know, a great practice, great life. It's not just a motto. It's a promise. The way I try to articulate it with my clients, especially in the beginning of the journey, and I try to reiterate it at the end of the year and at the beginning of the year, is my commitment is to two things. One is really objective, and I know the other is subject. One is, is I want you to make more money, okay? And two, I want you to enjoy the experience of making more money. And both of those things are really critical. So you ask biblical quote, what does it profit a person if they gain the whole world and lose their soul? And I will tell you somewhere about 15, 20 years ago, I had heard that long before then, but it took about my mid forties before I really realized, oh my gosh, you can lose your soul along the way fairly easily. My favorite movie, the best movie in the whole wide world, the best movie in all time. I require viewing of it in my family. I have son-in-laws before they could join the family. They had to watch the movie, (laughs) Joe versus the volcano. Okay. Okay. Great movie. Go home and rent it if you have to. Okay. Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan. And uh, it's an allegory. The scene is a bunch of people lifelessly marching into work. And there's a little flower there. And as people step on the flower, Joe revives it kind of thing, but then steps forward and then steps on a crack and the sole of his shoe comes off. And when he's asked what's wrong, he says, I'm losing my soul. And Uh And that movie, because that becomes sort of the metaphor for the movie, you know, that is so tied to individual commitments and pursuits and practices. But I think it's important for an individual to learn what puts wind in their sails. And the answer is across the board different. You know, there's a lot of people who say, I'm, I'm retiring to spend more time with my family. That's lovely. But I think there are a lot of people who love their family dearly, but their family doesn't put wind in their soul, in their sails. Right. 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 Um, you got to learn what it is that puts wind in your sails. And I think competing in this marketplace has a soul sucking component to it, has a pace to it that's hard to sustain. You're dealing with a variety of people have a variety of quirks and personality issues, you know, all of that kind of dynamic that if you don't determine and figure out the combination of ambition, pursuit, I'm GG, but not Gordon Gecko. Gordon right, Gecko right, would right. say greed is good. I would say ambition is good. Am- right. Ambition is good. But in the pursuit of ambition, it has to be balanced against identifying what is the pace and the rhythm that I need to have. And then the practices that put wind in my sails, renew me, restore me, keep me grounded, keep me from growing off the rails, running amok with ambition. Because running amok with ambition, those people who also have leadership skills, historically could become pretty dangerous people. Okay. And okay. I think of most talented 22, 23, 30, 33 year old folks who are talented in whatever field. And I see them as lawyers who are very, very bright, very, very capable and very, very talented. They have ambition and they want to be influential people and they want a degree of personal power. And I think all of those things are virtuous and good. And as a coach, I love coming alongside of those people and driving some of that. However, you will either crash and burn or become a dangerous human being if along the way you don't reflect on your vision, your values, the people that matter, and how to stay fresh in a marketplace that can be really soul-sucking. I, I don't know if that exactly answers your question. Yeah, it does. It does. And, and I will tell you that you've used the word reflection multiple times in the last hour. And I think that's a key component is being self-aware enough or self-reflective enough. All that keeps coming to mind the way we're talking right now, you have a very almost, it's probably a philosophy and religion background, but you have a very Zen-like approach to the business of law, right? To just bring it full circle, what you just said, along with the key words you keep saying throughout are, you know, are you reflecting, right? Like one of the big practices that I took away again from Atticus probably 10 years ago, I've been meditating religiously. And especially now where that agitation was so high, I was like, I got to bring my stress level down. So I really went back to a committed meditation schedule. And what happens when you close your eyes for 15 minutes? And it's funny, I was having this conversation with a young 25-year-old marketing person, right, Jules? About meditation. And Jules's feedback was, 
I don't know if I want to be alone with my thoughts for 15 minutes. I'm like, and that's why <laughs> you need to meditate, right? Because the, and you laugh at Jules, but that's what I was saying to you last week that mm -hmm. the reflection on your external impact and on those around you, which is what you're talking about, Glenn, is if you don't do that, that's where you can become that scary person, right? You mm -hmm. get caught up in the power, the money and everything else. And all of a sudden, not only are you a nice person, you could be a dangerous person, yeah. right? So mm -hmm. I love that all of your background, I think that's what gives you such a rich depth of experience in the coaching space. I think that's what sets you at like the top of your field. Well, thank you. Thank you. You know, you talk about Zen and that's a concept that comes more from an Eastern philosophy. I'm more rooted in Western philosophy. But in recent years, I really kind of had a sense of, can't even remember the author, but he wrote the book Flow. And Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I forget his name. It's hard to pronounce. Uh, Mickey, it's like Mickey, Mikhail, yeah, something. I can't, I can't remember. But Hard it's, name to pronounce. But what's really interesting is you look at this conversation and the one we just had, is you look at ambition and a leader needing to have some sense of a picture of a preferred future, right? And then they also have to have reflection. And you realize those two forces are learning from the past and looking toward to the future. But all of that is meaningless until you figure out how to make it matter in the moment now. Right. And right. flow and Zen, in my estimation, are really what are the practices that allow you to draw from the past, of see the future, but be in the moment and apply everything in that moment, in that moment and apply it. So it, tying that to like my martial arts background I experienced those flow states and what's beautiful is everything you just said is a hundred percent accurate. You take what you've learned and it's ingrained on a subconscious level almost. You're applying it in the moment for an outcome in the future without being aware that those forces are all operating together yeah, and yeah. that, yeah. and that, and that does happen in business. And I have those calls with even, even this conversation. Mm -hmm. A lot of stuff that you taught me 10 years ago is starting to gel together as we're talking about it, right? And it's the same thing that happens in the coaching process. I'm sure you see that if you have clients like me, the aha moments where you're like, holy shit, that's what, that's, what, I got it. I understand what you're talking about. Like, that's got to be very satisfying for a coach like yourself. Oh my gosh. You know, Tom, I remember you in the practice builder for a couple of reasons. One, you were in that room and you were one of the younger lawyers in that room at that particular time. And I just remember how committed you were to learning this and mastering it. And I don't think you let a break go by that you <laughs> didn't make a beeline to one of us facilitators yeah. and say, all right, you're going to give us 15 minutes. I'm going to bypass right. a bathroom break to suck out 15 right. minutes of whatever I <laughs> right. can suck out of you because- Sounds like Tom. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I always ask the one question, like if you had to look at the one thing in your career as the biggest needle mover in your professional coaching career, what would that one needle mover be for you? Gosh, one, there's so many, but the one, I've had the good fortune. I don't know whether it was just instinct or intuition or whatever, that I, I have a fairly good sense of who are the people personally and professionally that you really led into your life, right? And uh, I got married at 23. I started dating my wife at 21. She's the best human being I've ever known. And how do you know that at 21? I think that's a rare thing. And, and I mean, just who she is as a human being, I'm just amazed that I had some sort of wisdom, I guess. I don't know to recognize that. But as a professional, you know, in 2000 and beyond, it was clear to me, and there were rough roads. I mean, there's an interesting history to be told that this ain't the format to explore, but there were a lot of really rough roads. But the process of the rough roads revealed to me that for me, I needed to be in relationship with people like Mark Powers. I needed to be in relationship with people like Sean McNallis. I needed to be in relationship with Patrick Wilson. When an opportunity arose and I had the opportunity to invite Glenn Finch to come and collaborate and be a part of the team, Steve Riley came along and, you know, just agitated me to a whole new level. I will tell you that the both your levels of success and your enjoyment of the process really, really hinges on practicing some degree of wisdom around the people that you really invite into your life professionally and personally. That is powerful. Yeah, mm -hmm. 100%. It's about people. It's yeah. always, about it's always about the people. people. Yeah. So mm -hmm. Glenn, listen, thank you so much. I want to say thank you for your contribution to my practice in general. 
there's no way we would be where we are had I not done the coaching facilitated by you and Steve and having Patrick in my life as my one-on-one. And I know I have sent over probably two dozen people over the years to Atticus just because I have firsthand experience. You guys are not only probably the originator in the space. I don't know anybody who did it longer than you guys and, and ladies, but your vision and your mission has always been on point and pure right? Like everybody in that organization, the organization itself has always cared about the lawyers and law firms they worked with. There are other entities out there and it's all about upselling. And the best content I still have ever seen on the business of law all comes out of Atticus. Still to this day, still to this day. So um, I'm a huge fan. I want to say thank you for coming on. Uh, Hopefully I'll have you on again. Thank you for all you do for the profession as well, because by giving lawyers a great life and a great practice, it really counteracts a lot of the bad stuff going on out there in the practice of the law, the the low mental health, the suicide rates, the alcohol, all that addiction stuff. You guys are a beacon of light. And I really, I can't thank you enough for all you've done for myself, the law firm and the profession as a whole. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for coming on. Thank you for the invite. Uh, Anytime, anytime. You're welcome back anytime. This is the Lee Council Podcast. You can listen wherever podcasts are distributed. And if you got value out of today's episode, please go to Apple Podcasts. Leave us a five-star review. Share it with friends, you know, any law firm owners you know or business owners you know or anybody that might be interested or find it interesting, you think. So I really appreciate you tuning in. And uh, peace. We're out. We're out.